um, now that it's officially time to start the lecture. Um, so the first thing I want to say, I found somebody's little silver palm top computer in, the, in CLB after the last lecture and I handed it into security up in Matthew's building so that, that was yours. You can go find it at Lost Property. Um, the today's lab, remember in today's lab if you haven't already uploaded your assignment 2 to the web, um, you'll be putting that on the web and we'll be doing some stuff with variable length lists uh, which we'll be talking about today. And assignment 3 I just released. Um, assignment 3 is you're going to be implementing a high score list for a very boring little game. Um, I've got a demo app of it here. Um, the game basically consists of you press the play button and you watch the cube spin for two seconds and then it gives you a score. Um, but so I've written the, um, and, oh good you can't see that. Up here in the bit you can't see, um, when you, if you go and check it out yourself, it tells you um, what, the score, what the score that you just got was and the list of high scores underneath. Oop, and I'll just turn that off. I just forget to turn that off. Quit. Um, so yeah, it tells you the score that you just got and a list of high scores. Um, the list can be can grow as long as as long as you want. So as every time, um, you really can't see a thing from that. That's great. Um, every time you press the play again button, you play the uh, the little rotating the little cube rotates again, and then you get another score and it adds that score to your high score list. Um, the, uh, the high score list should only show five scores per page, but again you can't see, but there are next and previous buttons here on the screen which allow me to page through that five scores at a time. So if I, if I play this several times so that I have um, more than five high scores, um, then so now we've got like seven scores in the list, only five are being shown on this page and then I press the next button uh, to go onto the next page and, and, go, and I can press previous to go back again. If I keep pressing previous nothing happens and if I keep pressing next it doesn't go beyond the end of the list. So, so that's your task. Um, this one, so there won't be any storyboarding for this task because basically you know all the functionality is, is exactly what I want you to do here. Um, so uh, you can make it a lot prettier than this. I've really only used the very basic GUI um, commands to do this. I haven't made, made nice fonts or layout or anything. But, um, but this is what I want you to do. So you want you to show the last score. I want you to show the list of all high scores in descending order, um, five per page, and be able to page through them with the next and previous buttons. Now I haven't shown you how to do buttons yet, so we'll talk about that. Um, actually that will probably have to wait until next week. I'll try to fit it in today if we can, but if not, we'll be next week. Um, but for the time being at least you should be able to um, keep a list of scores and keep them sorted. And we'll talk about um, variable length lists today. Um, making uh, buttons is very easy. It's using the, the same GUI, same sort of GUI commands as we did for making um, labels, so that shouldn't take too long. Um, Yes, that's all. And there's an optional um, extra mark if you want um, to attach names to the scores, but that's entirely optional and is probably harder than deserves a single mark. But I can't give you, I can't just um, you know pour out bonus marks. So um, so that's just if you want a challenge, really, rather than um, uh, you know a worthwhile use of your time. If you want to maximise your marks, um, I didn't bother doing it myself. So, um, if we go back to here, the, um, so there's a list of requirements there of exactly what I wanted to do and if we go in further, um, this is a list of basically the competencies I'm expecting you to show in what you're doing here is to be able to use, use arrays, either the fixed length or variable length arrays to keep track of multiple scores use the GUI to display the text and the button controls and use strings to create and format the text for display. Um, in this assignment I'm providing you with two scripts um, in advance. The game script just does the little rotating cube thing and, um, and then when it's over it sends the new score to the scorekeeper script. 
the scorekeeper script is the one that you're going to be filling out. So the scorekeeper script, I've just made the basic outline for it. I want you to write the code inside. So if we have a look at that, oh, you can't really see that, but there are, there are two methods in here. Um, there's the add score method, which is going to be called by the game, which, uh, add, which when the game is over, and this will add a new score to the high score list. And there's an on GUI method, which will be displaying the, um, which will you use to display the GUI. Um, now you've only got to display the GUI when the game isn't playing. That's the other thing to note. So you've got to make sure that this, when the game is playing, that this doesn't do anything. Now to help you out with that, inside the uh, game script, so the game script has three methods, um, a play method which just starts the game playing for a certain length of time, an is playing method which you can use to, to ask the game whether it's currently playing or not. So you probably want to ask, your, your scorekeeper will probably want to ask the game, is the game currently going? And if it is going then it doesn't display anything and if it isn't going then it displays whatever it has to display. And there's an update method there which makes the cube spin around for a little while and when the, uh, when the time runs out it calls add score and just gives a random score. Um, so you don't want to change this file, the, uh, the game file you should leave as is. You're only going to be making changes to the scorekeeper file and you're only going to be submitting the scorekeeper file. Um, so don't change the game file or you know, we won't know why. We uh, won't know what your code's meant to do. Um, you, teams are optional for this assignment. You can work in pairs or alone. Um, you can, you'll in, in the week 10 lab, I'll give you a week to work out who you, whether you, who you want your partner to be, but the week 10 lab you should tell your, your tutor who your partner is in the same way as we did for the previous one. Uh, the deliverables are the completed scorekeeper script and a web version of your game. As such it is, there's no storyboard requirement for this assignment because there really isn't anything for you to storyboard. Um, it's exactly what we've got all, uh, there already. The marking therefore is 50% on style and 50% on correctness and there's a breakdown here on the different parts of the correctness and there's a bonus for if you implement um, names attached to scores but that's significantly hard so um, yeah. Um, and, like a, and as with the other assignments this is worth 10% of your final mark and it's due at the end of week 12. Um, and we'll submit, we'll put up submission instructions in a little while. Any questions about that before we uh, dive back into what we were doing? No? Is there differences yep. in marks between people who do it by themselves or people who do it in teams? No. Okay. It'd be marked the same way. Yeah. So, kind of makes sense to do it in teams, but you know, it's up to you. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, if there are people who you don't want to force teams on you if you don't want to be in a team. So, uh, from my point of view, I'd be in a team, but you know. Um, cool, so let's go back to what we were doing previously. So if you remember, where were we? We were writing this script here. So we were, we made Maybe we can turn some of these lights off so we can actually see a bit better. Let me try that. Um, is this the right thing? Ah, that kind of helps a bit. Okay, so as long as the camera can still see me. Hello camera. Um, so we were writing our game and what we wanted was to track between multiple targets and so we can now put several targets on the screen and we're tracking between them in order. But if we put too many, the additional targets get forgotten because we have a limit. Yeah. So we, have a, we had a size limit on our array and so if we draw up more than five things at a time then the, the ones beyond five just get forgotten about um, because we're using a fixed size array and, um, and we can't um, well, when we get more, when the array's full, we can't, we have nowhere to put extra things. So if we have a look at the script we were using. Um, we, uh, we, have, we have an array of targets. Um, we don't define how big it is here, but in the inspector we set it to be an array of size 5. We could if we wanted to initialize this to whatever size we wanted here, um, but 
it's easier to do it in the inspector because um, we can then change the value around. Um, when, we, uh, when we clicked on the screen, um, we called this add target method. So there was another script um, which creates targets, and when the, when the target is created, excuse me, um, we, uh, we called add target to add it to our list of things that we're looking for. Um, the, uh, well, the way that we added it was we had this list of targets, um, or an array of targets at least, and um, some, of the, some of the entries in the array were empty and therefore were, were null. Um, and so we'd go looking for the first entry, empty entry in the array, so the first null entry, and um, by looping through the, 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 uh, the indices of the array one by one um, from, um, until we found an entry that was null. When we found an entry that was null, we'd break. Now there are two possibilities when we get here, when you get to this point. Either we've found an entry, and so this will be a number from zero up to the number, of, up to, well, four, if there are five entries in there, we, it'll be zero to four. If this is, if we didn't find an entry, then we kept running through this list until we finished. Um, and we finished when rank was greater than or equal to the length of the list. So when, if rank is greater than four, um, then we've gone through the whole list without finding an entry. And so if the rank is less than the, the uh, length of the length of the list, then we have managed to find a place to put the new thing. If the rank is greater or equal to that length, then we haven't, we've failed to find an empty slot. Um, all the slots were full, and so we've just discarded that, that new target, and we're not adding that to our, our um, we're not adding that to our list. Um, the, then when we, uh, when we go to actually uh, do the updates, so and when we're actually doing the tracking, we look at the first thing in our array, um, which is target zero. If it's null, then, uh, then we don't have anything to do. So we're, so we're going to just return and not do anything. Um, otherwise, we're going to move towards that target, um, and we just got some basic uh, code for moving towards something until we're within a threshold. Um, if we're in, within a threshold, we destroy the target object and we go through the array promoting all the, uh, all the later things in the array. So everything, in, everything target zero gets erased and target one gets shifted up to zero, target two gets shifted up to one, target three gets shifted up to two. Finally, um, target four gets shifted up to three and then then target the new value of target four is null, and so we've got um, so we've d discarded one of our one of our entries in our list, um, and we've made space for a new target to be added to our list if next time we call add target. All right, so this is um, this is all very well, but is rather limiting because we have only five targets, or I mean, we can make it up to ten, but we c I mean we can change the size of that array to be anything we want, but um, but. We've got to. We've always got a fixed size on that array. <clears throat> if we uh, if we make it up to ten, and the person adds eleven targets, the eleventh one's going to get discarded. If we make it up to hundred, if they add one hundred and one targets, the hundred hundred first one is going to get discarded. And while it's easy to think, well, I'll just make it really, really super huge so that um, so that it'll never run out of space. First of all, that's inefficient because it's like reserving all this space that you're never going to use. And secondly, well, you never actually know that, that the player is not going to click a thousand and one times and create a thousand and one targets and make your code fall over. Um, so the best thing is to do is to design your code so that it should always work rather than just should probably work most of the time. Um, so what we're going to do is change our code to discard, to get rid of the, um, the fixed length array and use a variable length array instead. Um, so I'm going to actually go show, talk about that in the slides first. I said before that Unity has two kinds of arrays. Um, in a previous lecture, we talked about fixed length built-in arrays. Um, and they're the ones that we've been using so far. Um, but there are also variable length arrays. And they're implemented using the array class. Um, this is really annoying that they have two things with the same name. So. I'm going to call variable length arrays lists because that's the common name for them in other programming languages. Most programming languages say that an array is something that has a fixed length and a list is something that has a variable length. 
Um, but in Unity, it'll always be called an array. Both kinds are always called an arrays. But it's just going to get really annoying if I have to keep saying fixed length array, variable length array. So when I say list, I mean variable length array. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to use the word list. But, um, so, so, um, so when we create a built-in array or a fixed length array, um, we define the, le the length of the array when we, when we create it. So if we create a new array of integers like this, this is an array of 10 integers. And the length of that array is now 10, and that will never change throughout our code. That, that array will always have 10 things in it. Um, on the other hand, the length of a list can vary. Um, if we create a new list like this with the new, again, and the name of the class array, and an empty brace, empty parentheses. This will be a, a, a new list of length zero, but we can add things to that list and remove things from that list, and it'll grow and shrink as we do. Um, so, in the same way, we can assign um, an array uh, by value if we want. We can create a new array saying this is the array of one, two, and three, and that will create an array of length three. We can also do, um, we can create a list in the same way where this is a list, uh, it's a new, uh, we say new array, and then in the parentheses, one, comma, two, comma, three, and this will create the list, uh, automatically create the list with the values one, two, and three in it in order. This is nice, but the only thing you've got to be wary of here is that, uh, and it's not documented, I only found this out by experimenting, is that if you, um, if you say new array three, it assumes rather than that, value, that three as being a value to put in the array, that three is the size of the, sorry, that three is the size of the list that it wants to create. So this actually creates a list of three nulls. Um, that's annoying. Uh, it should, you'd think by consistency that this would do this, would create a list with just the number three in it. It doesn't. Um, so watch out for that. That's a, that's a trap. Um, most of the time, it's probably not appropriate to be creating new lists in this, uh, like initializing a list in this fashion anyway. Most of the time, you'll just want to create an empty list and then put things in it once you've created it. But um, you can use this syntax and you, know, you will encounter this syntax sometimes. But um, just make sure, this is all right if you use two or three or four things, but if you have only one thing in there, it'll do this instead, which is wrong. Um, I wouldn't have done that if I'd designed the language, but I can't change that. Ooh, look, it's gone color. Ooh, that's pretty. What have I broken? Oh, we're going into Technicolor. I've, one of the wires somewhere has broken in my, nope, yellow, white. There we go. That was fun. Okay. Um, that was exciting for everybody. Probably the people on the video didn't get to see that, but those of us here in the lecture theater just had a psychedelic experience. Um, arrays have a length variable. So arrays and, uh, sorry, lists and arrays um, uh, are very similar in many ways. And often they, they can be used sort of interchangeably. So like arrays, we have a length variable on, on, a, on a list. So an array, if we have the array of one, two, three, and we print out its length, um, we'll get the number three. But an array's length is read only. So if we try to set the length to four, we'll get an error. Um, a list, on the other hand, also has, if we create the list, one, two, three, um, then if we print that, that'll also have the value of three, but we can set the length of the list to four. Um, when we do that, it, it tacks on a fourth element automatically, and that fourth element is going to be null. Um, if we then set the list to a smaller value, it actually removes it li elements from the end. So if we set the list, link, list length to two, it'll abbreviate that list to one, two. So if we, if we set the list, the length to longer than the existing value, it just pads it out at the end with nulls. If we set the list to length to shorter, it'll drop things off the end of the list until it's the right length. Um, and if we then set the list to be longer again, uh, it would just pad this out with nulls. So the, the, the va previous values that are in here are forgotten. Um, we can't, as soon as we shorten the list, those, those values are thrown away. Um, we can access elements of a list in exactly the same way as an array uh, using this, this square brackets notation. So if we have an, a, a list of three things, one, four, five, 
then we can we look at the elements 0, 1, and 2, and they're 1, 4, and 5. And if we try to look at element 3, there's an error. That's exactly the same as what we encountered with arrays previously. Um, we can change values in the same way as we do with arrays. Um, if we change the value at list 1 to 9, then where the list was previously 1, 4, 5, the list will now be 1, 9, 5. Um, so really, I mean, this looks exactly the same as what we were doing with arrays. Uh, the difference is, the main difference is this. Um, a list has the ability to add and remove elements. Um, in particular, there's, there's two methods for adding and two methods for removing. Um, we can add or either at the beginning of the list or at the end of the list. Um, strangely enough, there's no way to insert a value into the middle of a list. I don't know why, because usually there is in other implementations, but Unity doesn't have that. So if we start off with a list of 1, 2, and we add, we use the add method to add 9, add adds at the add puts elements at the end of the list. So if we add 9, then we get 1, 2, 9. The, un the unshift method because it's the opposite of the shift method, which you'll see in a second. The unshift method adds at the front of the front of the list. So if we unshift seven, we get seven one two nine. So um, so we can use add to add new elements onto the end of the list, and we can use unshift to add new elements onto the beginning of the list. We can remove elements um, again using. So if we have a um, a list of one two three four. The pop method removes things from the end of the list. So if we say x is pop, uh, x equals list dot pop, then we will pop this fourth element off the list. So x will be four, and the list will now be one, two, three. Um, so pop removes the thing from the end of the list and returns it as the value. Um, we can also use shift to remove things from the front of the list. So if we say y is list dot shift. We've currently got the first thing on the list is 1, and so y is now 1, and we remove that first thing, and so the list is now 2, 3. So we can, um, we can add and remove elements from either end of a list. Um, uh, there's actually a method for removing things from the middle of the list, but for some reason or other there isn't a method for inserting things at the middle of a list. Um, don't ask me why, I don't know. Um, there are actually there are a couple of other methods that are worth looking at. Let me just look at that for a second. Um, so the documentation for this is in the script reference, in case you want to look it up. Uh, if we can load the script reference, let's see if we can load the local copy of the script reference. Help, scripting manual. That's better. Uh, so if you search for array in here, there's a, um, there we go. So the array, this is the, the API description for the array class. So this tells you about the fact that there are two different kinds of arrays. Um, but there's an example of the array class and an example of the built-in uh, built arrays. And it talks about how to convert between them. You probably don't need to worry about that. But here are the methods that I just mentioned zoom in on that. Um, so we see there's the, uh, the add method and the unshift method are there and the pop method and the shift method are there and there are a couple of other ones in here that are, might be of interest to you. Um, there's a clear method which clears everything out of, the array, out, of the, out of the list. There's a remove at which removes an element from a particular location. Um, there's a reverse and a sort method which you might want to use in your assignment. Um, the sort method automatically sorts the, uh, the list in ascending order. Um, the reverse method changes, reverses the list. Um, you can also join uh, two, uh, two lists together to create a larger list if you want using the concat method. And there are a couple of other things there you might want to look at. Um, it's a bit of an odd selection of things. Usually it's kind of vaguely incomplete. I don't know why. In other, in other languages, lists are a bit more functional. This one has a fairly uh, weird selection, basic and rather weird selection of methods, but never mind. Um, it does what we want it to do, at least for today. So the other thing you, um, the other thing you should be aware of 
is that one of the very common things that we do in, in post handling lists is to do some operation on every element in the list, um, which is iterating over the list. So we do some operation on the first thing and then on the second thing and then on the third thing and so forth. Um, there's a special version of the for loop to make this as a shorthand for doing this. Um, because we write the same code many, many times, it's, it's nice to have a shorthand version of it in the, in the uh, language. So, whereas normally we'd have four and then the three parts, the initializer, the, the, uh, the guard and the incrementer, here we've got four and then we've got var and then some variable name in some array name. Um, and what this does is that this variable, so it creates a new variable item in this case, and the value of this variable is set to iterate through the values in the array. So if we have the array, uh, we start with the array 3, 4, 9, then the first time we run this loop, uh, item has the value, is set to the value 3, uh, the second time it's set to the value 4, and the third time it's set to the value 9. So this prints out 3, then 4, then 9. So um, this is just a way, if we just want to read successive values in the list, uh, or in this case in an array, um, then we can, uh, we can use this thing, this kind of version of the for loop. Um, so this is, this is a built-in array, um, but the exact same version of the for loop works on a, a, a list as well. Um, so if we use the, uh, the list, the array class to create a list, then we can use exactly the same syntax to loop through that. Um, so, the, uh, this is just handy uh, if you're, because you're going to, because you generally find you're writing these kind of loops very often and it's just rather longhand to write it out in terms of looking at each element by its index. So if you just want to do the same operation on every single element, you can do this. Now, the disadvantage of doing this is you have no way of changing the elements of the list if you do this. You're just reading the elements one by one. You can't actually write into them. And you don't necessarily know where and what index you're up to. So if the index matters, or if you need to actually write the element, write, change the elements as you iterate through them, then you're going to need to do the longer hand version of, the, of this. But if you just need to read them and do some operation on them, then you can um, use this shorter version. Okay. okay, so that's the, um, I think that's all I had in there. Let me just check. Yes. So that's the, the theory of using variable length lists. Now let's see if I can actually use them to, uh, to do what I want in this waypoints game. So, oh, I'm going to sit down. That's better. Um, so what we're going to do is replace our, our here we had a, um, an array, a built-in array of game objects, um, and that was a fixed size array. So what we're going to do is replace that with a variable length array, so with a list. So when we start, um, so when we start this script, we're going to create a new array there. It's initially going to be empty, so there are not going to be any targets. We now need to add a new target here. This becomes a lot easier. We don't need to worry about all this business about checking for where, where is an empty spot in the list. We just say uh, targets.add the new target that we got. And that automatically just tacks it onto the end of the list. We don't have to go looking for an empty spot. The, the, uh, the list, if the list is empty initially, it adds a new target onto the list and it'll just keep tacking new, new targets on. Um, we need to now... Now we don't know, at this point we would uh, face, there would be a prop bug here because if initially the list of targets is empty, then trying to access target zero is not going to work anymore. Um, so because accessing target zero in an empty list um, is, is looking beyond the end of the list, there is no target zero. So we need to first of all check um, whether there are any targets in the list. So we can say if uh, targets dot length is equal to zero. Now this is where we know that there's nothing to do, so we can just return. So nothing to do. Um, so now we know we've returned if there are no targets, so we know that there must be at least one target in the in the um, 
in the list. So it's fine for us now to get target zero. Um, whenever you're accessing an element in a list, you've got to make sure that you know that element's going to be there. Um, so either you've got to know from the design of your code that there will always be a target zero, or if there's ever the op if there's ever the case where the target might be empty or the target list might be empty, then you've got to handle that case before you go and access element zero, because if element zero isn't there, then your code will crash. Um, Okay, so we can remove that now because that's never going to be null because um, we know that there's a, if there's an element there, then if there's something there, then it's not going to be a null value. It's actually going to be a target that somebody's given us, which is fine. We can do the same code as we had before for tracing after it. And the nice thing now, again, if we need to, um, once we've destroyed the target to remove it from the list, all we do is we want to remove it. This target is at the front of the list, right? So to remove an element from the front of the list, we just say targets.shift. And there we go. That removes the front element from the list. And it becomes a whole lot nicer than the code that we had before. We don't have to worry about um, the internals of, of changing elements in the array or shifting things backwards and forwards. The class handles all it for us. So this is an, uh, the other nice thing about this over arrays is that this a list class provides us with an abstraction on, the, uh, on what's going on inside. Now inside this class, there are probably built-in arrays and it's probably creating new arrays and copying them around and something or other. Um, we don't have to worry about that. All we have to do is say, okay, there is a, we, we're sticking things. When we get a new target, we add it to the end of the list. When we've destroyed the target, we remove it from the beginning of the list and everything else happens automatically because the, array, the list class or the array class in this case um, does the work for us. So it makes our code nice, easier to read, and easier to understand, and less prone to bugs. So that's all good. Um, and that's all we have to do, I think, unless I've made any other mistakes. No, I think that's right. So now if we check that, two, three, four, five, I can add plenty of targets all over the place. And there we go, we track them all, and it's lovely. Um, one of the disadvantages of using, one of the yeah, disadvantages of using a variable length list. As you'll notice, if we look at the player, um, even though our targets variable is public, is a public variable, it doesn't come up in the inspector, which is a little bit annoying. Um, the inspector doesn't have the ability to display lists. Um, so it doesn't actually appear over there. So we can't, even though I had a whole bunch of targets, whereas previously we could actually see the targets being created and deleted in the inspector, now we can't because the list, because the inspector doesn't know how to show a list, at least in this version of Unity. All right. I'm going to do this. The thing I don't, I don't like about this code is that we've kind of mixed up the handling of the list in the same code as the handling of tracking objects. So what I want to do is actually make it a little bit neater. I'm going to take all the code for tracking out uh, and put it in its own function because this is just, so move to target. So what I'm going to do, and we're going to take in a, a target T and all this code here, actually let's just call that, yeah, okay, whatever. All that code to up to there. I'm going to take that out of there and stick this up here, all right? So this is really not changing the functionality. Actually, let's call that, if we keep that name target there, Okay, so then we can say um, if the okay, that, okay, so now we've got the move to target method abstracts that piece of code which does the movement. Um, so now what we can just say is uh, move to target target. All right, so. Now, the nice thing about that is it makes this piece of code easier to read because we're not confusing the, the target handling code with the tracking code. Um, and this function, we can debug this function on its own um, and change the 
and our changes to the, uh, the target handling code will not change this function at all. This function can stay as it is. Um, there's one last thing we need to do here, which is this function needs... We, we were relying on this code to tell us whether or not we'd hit the object. Now we've broken that by separating it out. So what we need here is to actually return... We'll return false if we haven't hit the object, and we'll return true... true if we have hit the object. So now this function, what we're going to do then is say variable hit equals that. If we hit, then, then that. So now, where before we had the test in here which said if we were within the threshold then, then destroy it, otherwise move towards it. Now we've moved that, we've broken that test into two parts. Up here we say, if we're far enough away, then move towards it and return false. If we're, not, if we're close, closer than the threshold, then return true. And now we're getting back that value, true or false, from our call to the function, and we're storing that value in the variable hit, and then we're just checking that value hit, and if it's true, then we're destroying the target. Now this makes this piece of code much clearer, because all, we, all this code says now is, if there is a target, then get that target, move towards it, if we hit it, destroy it, and remove it from the list. And so it makes our code more readable, and then if we want to know how we move towards the target, we can go and look into that method and see, okay, the way we move towards the target is by doing this. So this is, I mean, this makes no difference to the functionality of the code, really. This works exactly the same whether I had it the way it was before or the way it is now. But this is abstraction. This is what I've been trying to bang, in, bang on about all the way through, is that by breaking our, our code up into chunks, we can make the code easier to read, easier to understand, and easier to debug. Um, so this is a meaningful chunk. These sort of, this set of statements all fit together as one thing that's happening. And so it's useful to give that a name and make that a function on its own, um, which then makes our code at the higher level read more easily because we have name, meaningful names for things rather than convoluted bits of code that we have to work out. And the nice thing about this now is that we can, um, we can actually completely uh, divorce the, uh, the queue handling from the, um, from the movement. Um, if we wanted to, and I don't think I don't think I'm going to spend the time on it, but um, if we wanted to go further, we could actually put the queue as a completely separate object, a completely separate script, and then have multiple spaceships all removing targets from that queue, and each so then, like we could set if we had two two ships in our world, each one of them could grab the next target off the list, and you have one central uh, list object which is keeping track of what, what targets are available and each spaceship says, okay, give, I've just destroyed my latest target, give me my next target and, it'll, and the queue, uh, the list will, will tell it what the next target is to do and remove that one from it. Um, so we could go a step further and extract all the target handling out from this, this class. It doesn't, it would probably be, I mean, it doesn't matter in this case, but it'd be neater then if we wanted to add lots of guys doing stuff. But we won't go there because it's more complicated than we need to cover today. And I've told you that I talk about buttons. I am beeping. Oh, that's just because class is almost over. Okay. So I had a slide from last week in the GUI slide. There's a slide that I skipped over here back when we were talking about the GUI. Dum, 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 dum. Okay, here we go. So, so I'll, go, I'll go back a couple of things. The, um, we talked about the GUI label, um, the GUI label command. So the GUI class implements a whole bunch of different um, user interface tool, user interface controls. The label command um, yes, I know. Go away. The label command was the way that we put text on the screen. And so we give it a rectangle to put the text in, and we give it a label string, which was the string that we wanted to show on the screen. Now, very similarly, we have a, um, there's a GUI.button um, method, uh, which again takes a rectangle and takes a string, and it displays a button on the screen. So if we just, let me show you what that looks like in a, let's just create a, a completely pointless GUI for our, um, for our game here. 
So let's create GUI. Let's call it GUI. And let's create a GUI script. Okay. So we're not going to have a fun, an update, but what we're going to have is an on GUI method in here to do on GUI. Um, and so what we can do is say GUI dot label. So uh, we need a rectangle, so there'll be a var um, text rect. We'll call it text rect. That's really bad. Let's just call it label rect. Label rect. And that's a rect. I wish they'd call it prop the full name rectangle. I don't know why they abbreviate it. To anyway. Um, and we'll also have a button rect, which is also a rect. There we go. And the label's going to be, if we in that label rectangle, we're going to put the word hello, just because, you know, it's nice to have a friendly program. And in what we're going to do is create a button. And in the button rectangle, we're going to, uh, what should the button say? Uh, uh, hello, back at you. Um, We'll make a good buy button. What the heck? Just for creativity. So, if we now debug that, because I have a mistake, GUI.label is not a member of. What? What have I done wrong? GUI.label is not a member of GUI. I'm sorry. I must have done something wrong. What have I done wrong? GUI dot label. Yes, it is. What are you talking about? What have I done wrong? GUI dot label. Can anyone see anything wrong with that? Looks right to me. Why is it complaining? That's very weird. Hmm. Okay, let's go back to. Mm, I don't know what that is. Let's go back to the breakout project where we were actually showing high scores. Save. Okay. So we had in here our scorekeeper, and it had a scorekeeper script on it. And there was the scorekeeper script. And on GUI, see this was working. That's really weird. I don't know why a GUI label doesn't work in the other thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so if we have a look at this, uh, if we play, I've forgotten how to play. Oh, okay, I've seen to have removed some part of the game. Ah, well, that's great. I tell you, love it when it doesn't work. Um, why the hell is that not working? That's really weird. Label is not a member of GUI. Hmm. I have no idea why that isn't working. All right. This is what you get when you try to wing it in the middle of a lecture. Um, so as far as I would imagine, that should... Maybe I've got those things around the wrong way. No, that doesn't make sense. It is, it takes the rectangle first. Look, it's right there. <laughs> I'm going to copy that and paste it here. Label is not a member of GUI. That is weird. I have no idea why it's doing that, because that's code straight out of the other thing. All right, anyway, um, this hopefully will work when you try it. Um, so this should display the string hello in this rectangle and this string goodbye in this um, button location, uh, in this button rectangle. Um, and you should be able to click on that button. Now, the way you actually handle, you either work out whether or not the user has clicked on the button is actually really simple. All you do is say if GUI button, 
then the user has clicked the button. Right. So any code that you want to happen when the user clicks the button goes in here. Um, so that makes this is a you know, there, there, there. sorry this is a makes code running running button handlers really easily easy. All you have to do is just when you create the button you you uh, have an if statement here uh, which creates the button and tests whether the button is clicked at the same time. And if the button is clicked then whatever you want to do uh, has to go in there. So, so for example, if you um, if we had some sort of thing here, which was um, I don't know uh, whether the game is playing at the moment is initially false, right? And when you click the button uh, play. Then in here you set playing equals true. And oops, true if I can type. And then you might have some sort of function, your update function, which says if we're playing, then do whatever, right? And so that would be a way of making your making your button. Um, if you click the the play button, it's it's playing to be true, and then the game plays as long as playing is true, and then when playing is no longer true, it might come back to here. Now this would be a problem. The problem with this would be that this um, GUI state would stay on the screen all the time. So what you might do here is, and now I'm showing you partly how to do your next assignment, is if um, we're not playing. And so that would, um, so this would only display the GUI as long as you were not playing the game. And as soon as you press the play button, it sets playing to true. The, the game starts playing over here, and uh, and this, this this GUI will disappear because not playing is uh, playing is now true, and so not playing is false, and so that if statement will never happen. Remember, this GUI gets recreated on every frame. Um, so if you change the value of, of playing to true, then the game will, um, then the, this function will quit, the next frame will be drawn, and when the next frame is drawn, it runs this again, playing is now true, uh, and so it doesn't, doesn't run this code, and so then, it, um, and then playing remains true until such time as the, the game maybe sets playing to false. So eventually, eventually this says playing equals false. Right. So, um, under some situation, if I can spell playing right, under some situation, this will then set playing to false, which will then make the GUI pop back up again. Um, and so you've got the, you've got these two modes. If the game is playing, if playing is true, then the update loop is running. If playing is false, then the uh, the GUI is displayed, and as soon as and the GUI displays this play button, which lets you switch, turn the game back on again. Um, so that's the kind of thing you're going to be wanting to do in your next assignment for this. And we're out of time, so um, that's all we talk about. That's actually covered all the material that I wanted to cover in the course, so we've gone through a bit faster than I expected. Um, what I'm planning to do next week is go over my solution to the last assignment, because um, I know some people found it very difficult, different parts of it, so I wanted to go through all the steps in that. Um, then if you have any suggestions for what you'd like me to revise in the next couple of weeks, um, I'm happy to take them. If you send me email um, about ideas that you found difficult that you want me to go back over um, for the exam or for the, for the next assignment, um, I'm happy to do that. Um, so, but that's all, the, that's as far as, I mean there's plenty of more we could talk about, but that's as much as I really want to put in the course. That's everything that's in the exam. So. Um, yeah, if you have suggestions for revision, let me know. All right, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. See some of you in shoots. See others of you.